Welcome to our new series of Ardenwood Presents on Legacy Planning. We've titled it, The Timeless Impact of Planned Blessings, because good estate planning is intentional, loving, intelligent, and effective. I'm John Mitchell, and I serve as Executive Director and CEO of Ardenwood here in San Francisco. Thank you for joining us today. As I mentioned previously, this series, put, this series is something I've wanted to put uh, on for a number of years now, and finally all the details have come together. Your positive feedback on Tuesday's webinar was wonderful to hear and confirmed that we're on to something really useful. That's great. As you know, today's webinar is just Q&A to continue to answer your questions. There are a few left over from Tuesday and you are welcome to add more by using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Remember, the content shared today is only informational and is not intended to be legal advice. A replay of this Q&A session will be available on our website by tomorrow morning. And now, let me turn this over to Rick Bailey and Jim Maher. Rick, Jim, it's all yours. John, this Rick isn't stuff. This isn't stuff the stars or anything like that, right? These are supposed to be okay. All right. Never. So we know. <laughs> okay. The first one's a fun one. Rick, what is a trust fund baby? <laughs> so I think we've all come across this. We just didn't know what the term was. Basically, it's it's somebody that their parents or grandparents set up a trust. And these kids aren't working. All they're doing is traveling the world, playing and you know, living on boats and planes and constantly vacationing. So, yeah, you know, when, when we set up a trust, it really, and, and when we're doing our legacy plan, we need to think about how can we encourage our kids, grandkids to be productive members of society, to you know, and put themselves in a position to be better to better the people around them. Um, I think when we get, you know, when, when we get that entitlement feeling or our kids get that entitlement feeling, they no longer are, are productive. They're just out there having fun, spending your money. And I don't think that's what we envision for our kids and grandkids. Great point, great point. Okay. When communicating with your kids, should you include their spouses or significant others? That is a tough question. And I think it probably, uh, I'll go to what I would think the default is. The defaults uh, that I've seen throughout my career is the spouses and significant others are left out. That the trust or you know the legacy plan is, is going to the lineal descendants. And so when the meetings happen, you know, spouses aren't there. Now, in your situation, I, I mean, I, I've got married kids. I've included the spouses in on a lot of conversations. And it's one where I, they're part of the family. So I think you have to look at it and say, you know, how do you, how do you want to move your money along? And I know if you're including spouses and significant others, breakups and divorces have to be addressed. Um, and, and I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to this. I think it really comes back to what, what is your family? How's your family makeup? What do you want to have happen with? Remember, it's your money that you're passing on. And if that's one you want to pass it on to um, spouses and significant others, there's no, that's, that's great. That's your plan. So I think, it, but it is a tough one. I think everybody has to address it for them. Absolutely. Um, Rick, where are you located in terms of your uh, offices and business? My office is uh, Phoenix, Arizona. I also have an office in Las Vegas, Nevada. But I, you know, I would say pre-pandemic, I traveled a lot more. Now I do Zoom calls. So um, I can be reached there. And if I need to be low, you know, if I need to, you know, show up for whatever reason, then, then we make that happen. Great. Okay. Another question. Do you have to pay a trustee? 
It depends on who your trustee is. If you're going to use an institutional trustee as a trust company or a bank, yes, you're going to pay and they're going to have a fee schedule. If you are using a family member, a child um, is usually the, the next person to step in there. I would say most, I can tell you most of the documents will say pay a reasonable fee. And I can tell you the trustees ask me, um, what's a reasonable fee? And I usually, my, my answer to them is if you're taking time away from work and family, you should be compensated for something. Um, and it's usually a nominal amount, but it's you, I, I would say more of it's lost wages, lost time, but it really comes to back to what's the family dynamics. I, I can give you my situation. Like when my, when my parents pass away, my oldest brother is going to be the trustee. I would, I would probably guess he will not take a fee or at least he'll say he isn't going to take a fee. I know how much time is involved being a trustee or an executor of an estate. He's entitled to some of that. It's a lot of work, you know, at that point, taking, you know, helping everybody, making sure what happens. So I would encourage you to at least set something aside for them, for that, for doing that job. Great point. Um, this is one I, I thought after our discussion from Tuesday, that this question was worth repeating. So I'm gonna do so now. Do you have a will and a trust? Yes. It, and it, so if it's properly set up, you'll, you know, the, when we talk trust, if it's, you know, for the uh, foundational part of the plan, the, the revocable living trust, you'll hear it revocable trust, living trust. Uh, some people just refer to it as their trust. But really what that is designed is, is the inside of that trust is a will substitute. It's going to say, here's, here's who my family, you know, who they are. Here's where everything is going to be distributed. Here's how it's going to be distributed. Now, if you set up a trust, we have to transfer those assets, those titled assets into that trust now to make that trust effective. So, why would you have a will? Well, there again, it's like we talked about Tuesday, but if I, I have, you want that little will sitting out there and it's called a pour over will. All that says is if I forgot something, put it in the trust. Now, for, for people that are younger, that have kids that are minors, in the trust, you'll set out who the um, custodians and guardians will be for the children. And so that, that will takes on a dual role at that point. But it's one, we never do a trust without a will. If you can set up a will without having a trust, but then you're going to definitely be in probate. Great. And speaking of that, this follows right into the next question. When you go through probate, who is involved? The attorney has to bring in every potential heir and potential creditor, um, but who all, who all is involved? So let's go through the mechanics of it. Let's, let's say, let's just say mom just passed away. Dad's now going to be the executor. In that probate, dad would hire an attorney. The attorney would start um, completing all the documents to file the probate. The probate is, is, a, is a court proceeding. So it's very similar to a lawsuit. Um, the attorney will draft all the initial documents to open up the probate and then file that with the court. So usually, depending on the state, um, an attorney may or may not have to go to that first uh, court filing, but the documents get filed with the court. At that point now, what will happen is all of the heirs are notified and all of the creditors of, in this case, mom would be notified. And they would be given an opportunity to know what's going on they would see, be entitled to see all the documents that are going to be filed. And now if the, if the will is not contested, if the probate is not contested, things will move, move through. We'll have an inventory. We'll file the inventory. The executor, executor will get letters testamentary to start transferring the assets. And then there's going to be a closing of the probate. And so that's if it's not contested. At that point, the only ones involved are going to be the judge, 
In this case, dad as the executor of mom's estate and dad's attorney. If it's, if it's going to be contested, then whoever we've notified, whether it's, it's kids, grandkids, whoever thought they were entitled to be an heir of mom's estate, now they can, they can show up in court to contest any part of the proceeding, whether it's the filing of, and dad being named executor, whether it's the, how the inventory was made, who got everything. So that's where the probate really, if it's contested, it, it really goes off the rails quick because it is no different than a lawsuit and we've got parties contesting something. At that point, it's the attorneys, you know, charging whatever they have to charge to fight things. So it, it can become a mess, but, and that's one of the reasons why I like the trust over just doing a will and going into probate. If you think about this, the probate almost invites the fight to happen. Because if you think about what you're doing, you know, mom just passed away. Let's, let's, let's take this a little bit further. Let's say mom has kids from a prior marriage. Now, do those kids get along? Does no. mom's kids from the prior marriage think they're entitled to something? Do the kids now think they're entitled to something? Basically, that probate says, here's the, here's the opportunity for you to come protest. And where's all the money being spent? It's coming from mom's estate. It's draining the estate to fight that battle. If we do some pre-planning ahead of time, then we're going to address all of those issues of, is it a second marriage? Do we have kids from a prior marriage? Do we have kids that have special needs? Do we want to treat some kids different than others? You know, whatever those things are, if we're doing more planning and put that into the trust setting, we're going to avoid those fights that could, could occur. And then families don't talk to each other anymore. Fantastic. Um, another question. Might you mention something about 529 education funds? That is, how do they work and how do you set one up and whom and with whom can you do that? 529 plans, so 529 plans are mom and dad or grandma and grandpa can set up um, educational funds for the kids or grandkids. And they can get some, some tax benefits for setting that up. Now here's, and, and really it allows them to pre-fund a lot of the educational expense. It's one, you can go to a financial planner, you can go to your bank. Some, some of the plans, some of those 529 plans are actually administered by different universities. And so they're, they're pretty broad, they're very specific in how they set up. But if you think about it, what, you know, I can, I can gift the next five years worth of gifting to set up a plan for my grandkids. And so it's a great way to set that up. Now I'll give a caveat to this. When you set up a 529 plan, if, you, if you've got a child that's going to go to an expensive university and they're going to need some extra help. Well, all that money that you set up in a 529 plan counts as assets for the kids to pay education before they can get some financial aid. So it's one they'll spend your money first, then you get financial aid. So it's one of those where you need to think through it, you know, how much do I wanna set aside? Do I wanna give the kids control of that educational money? And, you know, that's, I, I'm, I'm not for or against 529 plans. I think they've got a place, but I'll also say this, what happens if the kid doesn't go to college? Now, at some point that money goes back to them and they can use it for whatever they want. What I like to see probably through the, through the legacy planning, if we're going to allocate some money for education, set up, set up an educational trust inside of your revocable living trust so that it's now you've got that money sitting there. You can, you can control it and you can put whatever, whatever stipula stipulations you want on it. This is specifically for education. Now, remember we talked yesterday or two days ago, education can be an Ivy League education. It could be all the way down to truck driving school. You get to decide what that is if you're, if you're the one setting up the trust. Now, if the kids, you know, child or grandchild doesn't go to college, 
Now you can say, here's how it's going to, I'm going to use these funds to help you. Or I can say, you know what, you didn't go to school, you don't get it. Or I can say, if you don't go to school, but you're going to start a business, we'll help you start the business. So there's more flexibility if you do it through a trust, your trust. A 529 is very narrow in how it's applied. Great. Next question. What requirements are added when an heir lives permanently out of the country? That creates some good problems or big problems it could. The question, when, when you start looking at um, people living in a foreign country, um, tax wise, it doesn't matter. So tax, from a tax perspective, if you are a US citizen or a green card holder, you're taxed as a US citizen anywhere in the world. So, you know, from a tax perspective, we don't run into problems. From a, you know, where, where we run into some practical problems, it's the flow of money and the flow of assets. So if I have um, a child that's living in, in Shanghai, China, and I want to get that money through the trust, now the trust will probably most likely still be domiciled here in the US in whatever state you're in. And so you've got to look at, am I going to keep the money here in the US or am I going to flow those assets over into China? Am I, so it, it really is one we can accomplish both, but we just need to understand how that's going to happen. And, and I work with a lot of clients that, that actually live out of the country, but set up their, you know, their, their US citizens, expats living outside of the country, but it's one we keep the trust domiciled here but we do then, and then we have to address any foreign assets as well and how that will be taxed or treated through the estate. So it's, it's not a lot of complication, but it, it's one that we just wanna make sure we get it addressed. Now I'll throw one in that comes along with that is if you have a, a US spouse and a non-US spouse, that one creates more problems because how we flow money to a non-US citizen can really up our, our tax bill. So the estate tax exemptions drop off significantly when it goes to, an ex, to a non-US citizen. Even though it's a spouse, we can't flow as much tax-free to that spouse. So we just have to add extra provisions in how we treat that. These are all good questions. Um, Question, are there any assets that should not be in the revocable trust, such as your checking account or an IRA? Checking account goes in the trust, IRAs and 401ks, any kind of qualified money, we don't want inside the tr in, in the trust. So if you think about, you know, just broad categories, so your retirement account stays outside of the trust. And with that account, what we would do is we would have you would be the, you know, you're the owner of it. And the beneficiary would be your spouse. The beneficiary can be your, your children or contingent beneficiaries. But we don't, most of the time, we don't want to move that qualified account into the trust. So if you think about that, bank, you know, bank accounts go in the trust, real estate, your home goes in the trust. You can put the title to your car in the trust. Anything that has a legal title, we want to address. And then pick and choose. There's most, most of the assets will go in the trust. The qualified accounts are the big, big one that we leave out. Some annuities we can leave out because they're, they're not going to pass through probate. They actually pass according to contract. So if you think about that, qualified accounts, life insurance policies, annuities, when somebody dies, there's a beneficiary already designated. So we know where it's going to go and it's going to pass according to the contract. But qualified accounts, I don't like putting into the trust just because if you don't do it right, you could trigger tax, income tax prematurely. So, Interesting. so along with the trust, that's why we would want you to have a, a durable power of attorney because if you become inca mentally incapacitated, we need somebody that can not only be handling your trust, which would be your trustee, we also need somebody that can address your retirement accounts or whatever assets we purposely left out of the trust. 
that would be controlled by the power of attorney. Hey, Rick, I have some questions on that too. I get asked all the time. So if I've got three siblings and my mom lives here in Sacramento, California, and I've got a couple of siblings in Seattle, or let's say uh, uh, it doesn't matter, Austin, Texas, for healthcare purposes, how important is that? You, do you line up the, the trustee underneath the one that's closest by your loved one to provide care, Rick, or what do you advise? I usually, if it's, if it's managing the trust, so if it's managing the assets, I'm usually looking at who's, who's best, not who's convenient, but who's best. If it comes to healthcare, and if I've named that in, in a healthcare power of attorney, I'm, I'm looking at, again, who's best, and who's best is usually also who's close. Right, okay. Because, you, you know, it's one where, like, you know, my parents live in Idaho, I live in Arizona. I would, I would love to be the one named to help them on their healthcare decisions, mm -hmm. but if something happens, I'm, I'm an airline flight away. Right. If they need help already, I've got two brothers that are close by, they're a much better choice for that. And so it's really, I think sometimes, and, and this is, I don't know where this you know, comes from, I guess it's just you know, an inherited trait, but it's usually the oldest gets it. Well, the oldest might not be the right choice. It's, you know, and I think we, you know, and that's where we, we, I like saying, let's take a step back and say, who's the best choice? Who's not, who do you, who's not entitled to it. Great answer. Jim, did you have another one? You know what, Rick, while we're on it too, um, since you're a life insurance expert, um, I have a lot of clients I see and they sometimes name their trust as beneficiary. And in a simple family, if I wanted to pass to my three boys, for example, am I better off naming each son for example, if my wife would be the first uh, beneficiary and contingent, my children, or do I put the trust down? I get asked that all the time. What's, what's your professional opinion on that? I think it goes back to control. If it's, if it's one, especially if I, if I have younger, younger kids, then I would like to see it go through, go the beneficiary be the trust. Okay. And the trust have stipulations on how that money can be used and when it can be used. You know, I, I use the example of, you know, if you if you give a million dollars to an 18 year old, <laughs> yeah. they're going to them and their friends are going to have a lot of fun till the money's gone. Right. And if this, you know, you think about this, if an 18 year old is given a million dollars the right way, that can that can influence their life for for a lot of good. So I think you have to look at it and say, what's the mature financial maturity of those children? Okay. And so if they're, if they're good decision makers, if they can, you know, if they're set, if they're, if they're really more structured in what they're doing, then I'm okay with them getting the uh, life insurance uh, benefit direct because they're not going to go blow that, that legacy of that being passed. If they are the, the kids that need that extra help, they need somebody helping them, looking over their shoulder, teaching them then put it in trust, but also put a trustee in there that can help them, okay. somebody that can teach them what to do. And the other one is, at, from an asset protection standpoint, if I, if I have the beneficiary set up as my revocable trust, and I, I can set it up in, in trust you know, for my kids, or in, in one for each of them if I want to, but I can add asset protection to that. And why would I do that if you think about it? In, in the asset protection world, we're always looking at what happens if, if you get into a car accident? What if you've got a judgment hanging over your head? Well, if there's a life insurance policy hanging out there, all that creditor has to do is keep renewing that judgment each year, knowing that if they renew it, and renew it, and renew it, somewhere down the line that life insurance comes in, it doesn't go to your kid, I take it as the creditor. So now that legacy that you thought you were setting your kids up for is gone. And there again, we're, we're, we're in a litigious society. Mm -hmm. you know, lawsuits happen. You know, some, are, some are legitimate, some are not. 
You know, somebody thought they were wronged and thought they could win the lottery in a lawsuit. But it really comes down to, if you really think through the legacy part of this, you can set your kids up, your grandkids up in a position to where they're, they're protected. Okay. Excellent. A couple more questions. Regarding the IRA issue, my brother who just passed on designated his trust as the beneficiary of the IRA, though the IRA itself is not in the trust. Does that pose any problem? It, yes and no. And, and what it is, it's, it's not a huge problem on its face, but it's one where when that pays into the trust. So you got to think back, this goes back to tying in your planning with the income tax thing, part of this. So <clears throat> when he set, the, set up his trust as his beneficiary, what will happen there is, and, and the default rule is, if I, if I die, my, my IRA or my qualified accounts move can go to my wife income tax free. I can roll it. She can roll it over to her. If she dies and the beneficiary are, are my kids, well, they can now roll that over. They can either take it and it's taxable, pay the income, I'll pay the income tax on the lump sum now, or it can go to each one of them if it's set up right. And at most they can stretch that payout over 10 years. We used to be able to stretch it over their lifetime. The new rules are you can only stretch it up to 10 years. So now instead of paying one big, huge lump sum of income tax, I'm gonna pay these lower amounts and lower marginal rates over a 10 year period. That's, that's the theory. If you name the trust as the beneficiary, if the trust is not set up correctly, you'll automatically trigger the tax as a lump sum on that IRA money. So it's got to be set up to where it goes out to an individual beneficiary. So if he has three kids in the trust, it's got to name all three of them. You get one third, one third, one third of the IRA, or you get the IRA, you guys get other assets. If it goes into a pot, then that pot possibly triggers the income tax now with no additional planning possible. So it's, you know, it's this one, it, it really, you know, I'm, I, I would love to give a better answer, but without knowing how that trust was set up, I can't give a detailed answer. Okay. I can say we've been very grateful here at Arden Wood to be beneficiary from time to time of, of IRAs. It's been really nice and it goes the full amount, you know, there's no tax obviously to a 501c3. So it's, we're very grateful to be IRA beneficiaries. And I'll tell you, that's, that's, I'll jump in on that. That is a great planning tool that I think a lot of people aren't aware of. It's, it's one I, I was just, uh, I'm helping on a, a planning case now where um, mom, mom's very, very charitable. She's been giving a lot to, to you know, various charities for quite some time. And now originally what her thought was, was she was going to pass all of her retirement accounts on and everything to the kids and the rest would go to charity. And I said, well, let's reverse that. Let's give the assets to the kids, the IRA to charity. And, and our first reaction well, was, why? Well, if we give it to the kids, it's taxable. If we give it to the charity, it's not taxable. That's the easy answer. And so it's just one where we can get the absolute same ultimate result of where it's going, but we can do it in a more tax efficient manner. So in this case, Arden Wood would get a, you know, would get the same amount of money as they would if we gave Arden Wood the assets. But the kids, if, if she were to give the kids the IRA, in reality, she probably gave them 50% of the IRA and 50% to Uncle Sam. So it's just think through that process a little bit more and share this. And we'll get into this, you know, here in a few months. But charitable planning is a win-win scenario for the family. Absolutely. Beautiful. Um, question. Is there a way to set up an educational trust without having a trust yourself? I don't need a trust as I have no real property. And all my financial assets are already designated through my beneficiaries within my IRA and bank accounts. Yes. 
So what, what you can do is look at it. It can be one of two ways. You can set up, so you're, you're most likely, if, if everything's set up, you're, you're still going to have either a will or a revocable living trust. And let's assume that you just, you're going to have just a will. In that will, we can say as part of your, as part of your estate that you're going to pass on, we want to set up a trust at death. It's an educational trust that will be funded at death. There will be set up at death as part of plan. And at that time, assets are going to flow into it through the estate. And so, yeah, you don't have to have that trust now if, if, if that's not part of your planning. The other part of that is, and the other way to do it is, you can set up that educational trust now. It would be set up as an irrevocable trust. You don't, you know, we, we set it up and we leave it what's called a dry trust. We're not going to put any money in that trust now. It's just, think about this, it's a box. We don't put, oh, don't open the lid on the box and put anything in there until you pass away. We open the box and we dump in through beneficiary designations what goes in there. So there again, it avoids the same probate process that we don't want to deal with. But now you can go out and, and just like you've identified beneficiaries for your IRAs, your, your life insurance, whatever, whatever those assets are, we now have a trust with a tax ID number that allows us now to dump that in and we've funded that educational trust at, at death, but we set it up today. Both of them get us to the same spot. It's just which one fits a little bit better. Neat, that is great. If I'm a co-trustee of my parents' trust, how can I best get educated in advance of how to administer it? I would say a, a phone call is probably the best way to do that, to talk through what, what issues. I, I'm going through that right now with a client of mine in Southern California. Um, his dad passed away. He was named as the executor. And every one of his friends, his neighbor, whoever he runs in and wherever he's at, has an opinion of what he should do. Yeah. Uh, the first thing he said was, my brother-in-law said, we don't have to value anything. And I stopped him and I said, yes, you have to go value everything. We need to know, is it subject to estate tax, which his, his dad will be. But it's one, really, what, as a trustee, here's your job. Your job is to, one, get your hands on the trust. Hopefully you've seen it. Sometimes people know they're named as trustee and have never seen it. So if you haven't seen it, blow the dust off of it and read it. And it's, it's one that might take you a few times if you're reading it at night because you're going to fall asleep a few times. Most trusts are very uh, unuser friendly, but it's good for you to read through it. You know, don't mark up the original, mark up the, a copy of it and just note what your questions are. From there, your job really in, in a global sense is very simple. It's get your hands around the assets. Hopefully they've created a list of what those assets are. You know, think about it, it's an inventory list. You're going to say, here's the assets and think about this and create a spreadsheet. Here's the asset, here's the value, here's who it's specifically supposed to go to or does it get distributed as a remainder part of the trust? So you're really identifying what it is and where it goes. And your job as the trustee is to make sure the where it goes is done as the trust tells you to. And that's where it gets a little complicated because a lot of these trusts are drafted boilerplate, probably is the right word for it. Mm -hmm. And boilerplate a lot of times by somebody that doesn't deal with estate planning. So they, you know, that attorney was uh, in court litigating a personal injury case, today's drafting a trust. And when it comes to distribution, I can tell you most people will say, when it comes to the kids, distribute a third of it when they're 25, distribute a third of it when they're 30, and distribute a third of it when they're 35. So when you go back and read those trusts, tell me if I'm wrong. But it, it really is one you, so if you're going to be holding those assets for a number, you know, five, 10, 
15 years, now your job as trustee isn't, hey, here it is, distribute it, and I'm done. It's you're, you're on the hook now for the next 10, 15 years because not only are you distributing assets, you're now investing those assets. You're, you're the caretaker. And so as a trustee, you're, you're not in this by yourself. If you need to bring in a, a CPA, you need to bring in the attorney, whoever those extra helpers are, those professionals, you have the ability to hire them. You also have the ability to fire them. And so it's really, remember, get your hands around it first, read the document, figure out what the inventory is, list is, and then figure out where it goes and when. But specific questions, honestly, uh, feel free to reach out and we'll talk it through. Great. Well, Rick and Jim, thank you. That's all the questions we have for today. We're about 35, 36 minutes into our Q&A session. This is kind of what we had planned on when we were working on this a couple months ago. So thank you for your clear answers to everyone's questions and for underscoring the value of having an estate plan, having a plan. And thank you all again for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again on Tuesday, August 17th for our next webinar addressing ways to cover long-term care costs, another key aspect of legacy planning. Once again, the Q&A portion will then be on Thursday, August 19th. Please feel free to invite friends to join us by registering on our website, ardenwood.org. So goodbye for now, and we'll see you next month. Thank you all.